All right. <clears throat> We're on a brief history of evolution, chapter two. Uh, a lot of people associate evolution with Darwin and one tends to think that Darwin came up with this idea and before we didn't have anything and then he revolutionized everything with this idea that species evolved and other things like that and it's it's not the case there were a lot of people who gave him inspiration and who had come up with similar ideas also <clears throat> most of the evidence for what he was proposing didn't uh, come to light until he died you know the technology just wasn't there so we're going to look at some of the other people that, that influenced him or that influenced people that influenced him. And so, yeah, so we're just going to take a look at those, right? So he wasn't the first person to come up with the idea of, of evolution. He wasn't the first person to even provide any evidence. But at the time, you know, in the, in the first part of the 1800s, most people thought the world was, you know, anywhere from 2,000 to 8,000 years old, and that, you know, everything that was created in the beginning is still existing today. You know, so either it was all created at the very beginning, or there was periods of creation. So perhaps there was like a, a catastrophe and then everything was like recreated again. <clears throat> but the main idea is that his, you know, of this chapter is that his, his ideas were not created in a vacuum. And so let's, let's look at some other people. Um, Linnaeus. And, and a lot of these people that we're going to look at were some kind of religious figure like Carl Linnaeus. A lot of the people back then that went into science were religious people. So if you look at the person that we're gonna talk about, I think next week, um, Mendel, he was, a, he was a monk, like this was their job. They would learn theology and then they would also study things on the side so Linnaeus was one of them and you know there was this movement about a hundred years before him so he was around in the 1700s mid 1700s starting in about the mid 1600s there was kind of like this movement we need to start classifying things and that might sound kind of strange today well of course if there's something that exists we have to put it in a category right it's like our natural inclination but it things weren't always like that you know they didn't always just just because something existed didn't mean that it had to go into a category especially if you're talking about living things right do we we so every plant has to to be in a category or, or every insect you know, it wasn't like that <clears throat> but there was a, a movement around that time to classify things to compare things, contrast things. Linnaeus came up with a binomial system that we still use today. For example, um, Homo sapiens, right? Sapien is the species and Homo is the genus. And so, and, and then you can keep going back, right? So genus is a larger group and then we can go back into family and we can go back into order, you know, we're, um, or mammals, we have backbones, you know, so you can find things in common. We can find something in common with zebras, right? We have, we have backbones, for example. <clears throat> um, so anyway, the, the groups with similar traits are put together and then, you know, you put that, you kind of nestle that into a, um, into a larger group. And you just keep going, right? But 
the reason for Linnaeus doing this was to show all of um, God's creation and to show his divine plan. But something interesting that he did say was that, you know, sometimes new species are created and, you know, artificial selection, you know, breeding, we've had breeding for thousands and thousands of years, right? So they, they estimated that, that dogs were bred out like 12,000 years ago, like bred into different types of, of dogs. Right, so there, it's, it's not like this foreign idea that you could take something and mix it with something else and get like this new, this new species. However, everything that was created still exists today, right? So Linnaeus is saying that we didn't have extinctions or there's not so much more that has been created in time and just we don't see it anymore. Right? Everything that we've created or that was created is here. So it was all created. And if we bred some kind of poodle, it's also here. <clears throat> Stano, 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 Nicholas Stano, he was the first person to um, really recognize fossils. At least the first person in you know, we call this modern history. I know it's not modern, but. So in the mid 1600s, you know, he studied anatomy. So he was very interested in morphology and in bones and body systems of different animals and things like that. And, you know, I put here, he was also a, a religious person and most all of them were. Um, and so somebody, they, they had killed like a really big, shark and they had brought it to him to, to look over, right? And when he was looking at the teeth, he was like, yeah, these look like these tongue stones. You know, it's got like the same shape and size. And so people would bring these stones that they call tongue stones from like the mountain. And so he went back up there to check out these tongue stones and he brought the shark's teeth and he's like, yeah, these are the same things except that like these tongue stones are rock and you know, the teeth are teeth. So the other thing that was like weird for him is that they're in the mountains. So it's like, well, you know, how did these get up in the mountains? So he finally, you know, hypothesized that, you know, the water was, a, was above the mountains. And that doesn't sound too crazy to say that the, the earth was once covered with water. And like, maybe that had happened before other things. Um, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't sacrilege for sure. You know, it was, it was in keeping with what could have been possible. So <clears throat> mountains covered with water, shark's teeth fell out, fell to the bottom of the floor, you know, the sea floor, which was the mountain. And then the sediment landed on top of it. And then that sediment eventually replaced the, um, the, the calcium of the tooth and, and turned it into stone. So that, that eventually became rock. So, you know, he was the first one to really say, hey, there's these things called fossils. People didn't think of it before that. You know, that if you dig around in the earth, maybe you're going to find bones that became rock or even bones that had managed to stay as they are. So there is a history of the earth. Then the other thing is that the earth has changed. So that mountain wasn't always just there, right? Maybe the earth looked different at one time or another. So those were kind of two of his contributions to, you know, the beliefs that led Darwin to come up with his theory. So that's kind of what I mean by his contributions. Right? He was the first person to say, you know, to, to say, yeah, there is this, there are fossils and, and they, they have a record of our history. Georges Buffon, who was, um, he's got this super long name. Um, he was like this rich dude, obviously uh, French. So here we are in the 1700s. 
And I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but everything is happening here around the six, you know, mid to late 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s. So it's kind of like this 200 year span, a lot of things happen. Um, so chemistry and physics, that was kind of like a new thing. Just like some, just like we would say, you know, um, CRISPR DNA technology, um, the, the human genome, that's kind of like the hot thing today. <clears throat> you know, can we take just parts of a gene and make a vaccine? Back then it was like chemistry and physics. That was like the, that was like the, the, the new thing. So, you know, all the, all of the rich and influential people, you know, that was their thing. They were all into it. They had to talk about it. You know, that was the bling back then. You know, when you had cash, what did you do? You, there were no cars to get. You couldn't put 25s on your car. You just, you couldn't get a second or third car. There were no cars to have. So what did you do? You, you built a library. And, you know, you had, you had your friends over and you sat and drank, I don't know what they drank, but well, cognac, who knows, you know, and smoked their cigars. And then that big library is behind them and everyone's like, dude, you check out his library. And um, that was like the big thing. And then you would talk about stuff like that because that's what rich people did. They just talked about, um, they talked about things like science. So anyway, at this time, it was chemistry and physics. If you have people over to your house, that's what you do. You talk about chemistry and physics, and that's how you show you're rich. Yeah, I'm rich. I've got so much time. I don't have to work. I don't clean up after my horses. I sit around and read about chemistry and physics. <clears throat> so anyway, all that talk got Buffon to start thinking about it, and he's like, you know, Things are made from particles because that's what we're all talking about at our dinners. But, you know, maybe like the same particles. And he was, what, what was he thinking? He was thinking atoms, right? But he didn't have a name for it. But that's essentially what he was thinking. So maybe these atoms are, it's like the same stuff in living things as in non-living things. So you'll find certain amount of atoms in the dirt and you'll find these certain atoms in, in people. Well, you know, it's on one hand, it's a crazy thought because now you're saying that humans, for example, aren't like unique creations, but it's not totally crazy, like crazy enough to get you to die because, I mean, you know, no one's going to burn you for it because man is made from, from clay. So it, it, you know, it worked. It, it, you know, it's okay. It's, it's, you're, you know, you're not, you're not pushing the envelope here, but it was still kind of a revolutionary idea that maybe living and non-living things are made from, maybe the, the, the atoms or the lip or the particles that are in plants, you know, are, are, are similar to ones that are in um, fish. Now here, the next thing that I have here, this is the crazy talk, maybe a comet, hit the sun and chipped a piece off and that's what formed the earth and it was like super hot so nothing could live on it but it started cooling down over here's some more crazy talk over 70,000 years and then like life started to um develop and then as the earth cooled down these living things started making their way towards the equator where it was like warmer you know, and as they did this, their particles changed. Right, so this is what he thought. It would, so, it, you know, that stuff, that was like burn you type of crazy talk. But, you know, with his rich circle of friends, you know, they're willing to like accept all that stuff, right? They, they're hypocritical. You know, they had their talk out on the street, but then they had their talk with each other. They were like, yeah, okay, maybe, right? So, but th this was some interesting stuff that he was saying. You know, a comet hitting the sun? So what he's saying is that Earth wasn't, 
well, you know, you say the earth wasn't just made exactly how it is today. And you're saying it's a hell of a lot older than we thought it was. You know, we're thinking 4,000 years old. And he's saying like maybe 70,000. I mean, he didn't really know exactly, but, you know, this is a crazy number. And then the idea that your atoms changed or that you had changes. I mean, ultimately, he was saying that that um, organisms changed. So he was pretty influential. I mean, these were his contributions right here, that, that populations could change over, change over time. Nobody was, you know, for the most part, no one was saying this stuff. The earth was a lot older. There were a few people talking like this, but I mean, he kind of put it out there. And then Objects obeyed laws, which, which really what he was saying, and he didn't know it, is that they obey, you know, the laws of physics. That objects obey the laws of physics. You know, we have atoms, and they've got electrons going around them, and they stay in their orbit, and they act in a certain predictable way. So that's what his contributions were. So this is another guy influencing Darwin, because Darwin read up on all these people. Now we have Cuvier, which is around the same time, a little bit later, right? So he's around the late 1700s, uh, 1700s, early 1800s. And by then, by then fossils were kind of like a thing, right? They were becoming a thing. People recognized what fossils were and they were calling them fossils and they were under, you know, they saw that there was a value in them and they kind of had an idea of some places they could go to get them. <clears throat> um, so what he did is that he took fossils that people brought him of Siberian elephants and, and they were extinct, although he didn't know that. Like, nobody had this idea of extinct. Animals that were living are still living. So he looked at these elephant fossils and then he compared them to the bones of um of elephants in um, india and africa that had just died right so he had like bones that he knew was like in a living creature and then he had these fossils which he knew had to be older at least uh, how old don't know but older and he found that okay, they're both elephants, like they're all elephants, but the teeth were a lot different. Teeth were significantly different in these Siberian elephants. And in fact, we don't find elephants in this place anymore. So what's up? Well, they went extinct. So he was one of the first people to say, yeah, things, you know what, maybe everything that existed is not existing today. Sometimes things just, sometimes the whole species just die off. So that was his contribution. Another guy that made a contribution with uh, fossils was, was Smith. So he was in England and, and his job was to, you know, wherever you, whenever you want to like dig a canal, whenever you want to get water to this area or that area in England, he would go out and check places out. Hey, can we get through this rock? You know, what direction are we going to send this canal? Is it even possible to put one here or should we put it somewhere else, right? So, you know, his, he ends up doing a lot of digging. They're doing a lot of digging. He's, he's around when they're digging the canals. And so he's actually seeing the layers of the, the earth and he's noticing that he's finding the same fossils in the same layers. You know, when you go eight feet down, you're finding, he's finding a lot of this particular fossil. And then when you're 12 feet down, he's finding the same particular fossil. The one that he's finding at 12 feet, he never finds it at eight feet and vice versa, right? And then different places he goes in England, he's finding the same thing. So he's, he's noticing that pattern, right? So he, he ends up organizing a, a map. He makes a map showing like these papers. And so that's kind of significant. He's saying, yeah, you know, um, something was around 
and they're and you find these fossils in like a lower layer they're not around anymore but you find these different fossils a little further up and i think that that's newer stuff i think that these fossils are a little bit newer than the ones i found a lot deeper and so you know he's the first one to say hey yeah this this earth has like layers and maybe we can look at the depth of these layers and figure out you know one being older than the other so again very very significant finding <clears throat> john baptiste lamarck lamarck really propelled the uh the field but you know at his time a lot of people just laughed him off so when he was saying his stuff at dinner parties they were laughing at him and and they stopped inviting him and you know he'd show up with a cake and they'd be like hey hide everyone don't let lamarck see you and then uh but darwin was still listening to him like he didn't care like he read his stuff he's like you know maybe this dude's on to something so anyway lamarck studied plants and insects and he was interested in like how they were similar and and how they were different but you know he, he that was his thing right so and then he was really interested in fossils and he knew that like yeah you know these fossils like smith was onto something and and i think fossils changed and um what was a long time ago is not today and so he had some ideas and these weren't all true ideas by the way not all of these people are saying things that are true it's just like that's what they say for example life went from simple to complex that's not necessarily True, but that's what he thought, right? It's intuitive, it kind of makes sense. You know, that you go from like a bacteria and you become more complex, more complex, more complex, and finally we end up with this uh, human, right? And then you would say, well, why is there still bacteria then? He said, well, like that bacteria, some of them became complex and some of them just kept regenerating. You know, that's what he said. So we all came from like microbes or like bacteria or something like that, you know, that's what he was saying. So see, but but you know, as time goes on, these things get more complex, and they can adapt to their environment. That was a very um, significant contribution that he made. Although where he was different is that he thought that this could happen in the lifetime, and he used the example of like a giraffe. So giraffe keeps stretching its neck to grab the leaves, and because you keep stretching to grab leaves. He thought that there was like this nervous fluid in you and it would cause your neck to actually get a little bit longer. And so that by the end of your life, your neck is actually a little bit longer than it was when you were an adult, like an early adult. And that you could pass that on to your offspring. So the offspring would have the longer neck because of all the stretching you did when you were alive. And that was proved to be incorrect. And he also thought, you know, if you didn't use something, you got rid of it and you, and, and you know, it's partly true, but he thought it happened like, you know, in the, in the, in, within an individual's lifetime, you know, or at least by the next generation, right? So he had the time wrong, but the idea that you could pass changes down it was it was very interesting and then the, that fact that you can adapt to your environment i mean yes this was extremely influential for for darwin but this guy you know he i think he died poor and no one cared about anything that he said but anyway we get to darwin <clears throat> darwin he he gets himself on a a boat you know back back when you were like Back then when you were rich, you've got like these different things you would do. So if you're rich and you're into science, um, you go and, and study medicine, become a doctor. And if you don't want to do that, then you got to go join the clergy, right? So that was kind of your two, joining the clergy means that you're never going to study science. No, on the contrary, you are going to study science. You're going to, you're going to learn theology and stuff like that. And then, you know, what I, I don't know. I imagine they get up at like four in the morning and then start do their chants and their prayers and stuff like that. And now it's 
seven thirty, and they got the whole rest of the day, and they're done with all their with their regular job, right? So they go out in the gardens and and they start researching whatever they like to research. So those are the two things that you do. And Darwin was like, yeah, you know, I'm not into either of those. So he found his way on a ship. He found a captain, you know, and, th and this captain was kind of like crazy. He's like, oh, I got a whole family of crazies and my uncle like killed himself. My other uncle killed himself. And this one like talks to himself. And here I am a captain and I got like no one to talk to. And you're thinking like, well, why don't you just talk to like all the people that work on your ship? But that's not how it was. It was like super classist, right? So he's like, I don't know. What am I going to talk to those people about? Like drinking? I don't know. So he wanted like some other person on the boat that he could talk to. So uh, Darwin was trying to jump on a boat because he wanted to go see the world. So it like worked out, right? The cap so the, the captain let him on. Um, they went down to South America. They went lots of places, right? He was gone for like five years. But um, down in South America, when he was in Chile, Chile has like a bunch of earthquakes. Like even like today, tons of earthquakes, right? So he, he, he was in an earthquake and he saw, <clears throat> he saw the crack and he saw the land lift just ever so slightly. But you could see the difference and that, you know, he had just got done, like, on the, on the boat ride, he had just got done reading this guy named Charles Lyell, who said, yeah, you know, the earth changed, and it's not like the earth was, like, flooded, and then it changed because of that, or it changed because of a volcano. No, there's other things, just, like, little things, little subtle changes that, that change the earth over a really long period of time. You know, Darwin just got done reading that, and then they land in South America, and then he sees this earthquake and he's like, oh yeah, hell yeah. Lyle, it's exactly what Lyle was saying. I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> so that was a really influential thing for him, that he actually saw a change. And then the other thing was that he was on the Galapagos Islands. Now we're going further up the coast, out towards Ecuador, and then they're on these islands. And he's like, yeah, man, these islands are like, you know, you can see the islands from the other islands. But he goes on the other island and he's like, man, these birds are different. Right? Some had long beaks and some had little short stubby beaks. And if you look at the other PowerPoint that I posted, you'll see a photo of like these different birds. Right? They were finches. So he, see, he notices like, okay, on this island, there's not a lot of insects, but there's a lot of seeds. And these birds have these beaks that can break these seeds. But on this other island, there's not a lot of seeds, but there are like insects, but they're in these rocks. They're like kind of wedged and they're hiding out in the rocks. So these birds have like longer beaks. And so he was thinking, man, so birds can like be very specific to the environment that they're in, right? And so he brought these birds, a lot of these birds back to England and he took it to like a bird specialist, whatever you call them, ornithologist, anyway. The dude looked at it, and he's like, yeah, these are all the same bird. These are all finches. And so, you know, Darwin was blown away. It's like, are you sure it's like the same species of bird? He's like, yeah, because there are some things about finches, and I don't know what it is, but, I mean, there's some telltale signs that only finches have. So this guy confirmed it. These are definitely all finches. They just have different beaks. So that really got Darwin thinking. Did Darwin move on it? No, he sat on all his information. He sat back in England writing, doing more research. He didn't want to go down the road that Lamarck went down, right? He didn't want like his social group making fun of him and laughing him out of parties. So he was like, he just kept collecting evidence and collecting evidence and he was like sitting on his data until finally someone that liked him, Wallace, who was really influenced by him. You know, Wallace thought, man, this is awesome. This guy got on a ship and he was like in an earthquake and, you know, he went all over the world and I want to go over the world too. So he did. And when he got to Indonesia, he started noticing some of the same stuff as Darwin. And uh, like he noticed that beetles were like different colors depending on their like environment to kind of like blend in, but it was the same beetle. So he came up with really similar ideas um, as 
Darwin. So he wrote Darwin. And he's like, yeah, look, check out what I found out. And Darwin was like, damn, this guy's got the drop on you. He's, he's, this is my information. But Darwin had better evidence, right? So Darwin's been sitting around for 20 years, getting evidence, you know, putting his, making his case. But this other guy was going to get the jump on him. And he sent all of his stuff to Darwin. He's like, hey, Darwin, you know, I really admire you. And I trust you. So here's my work. Can you go present it to the Linnean Society, like this upper scientific society in, in London? And Darwin was like, oh, damn. Like, I've been working on this for 20 years, and this guy is going to just throw his stuff out there and, and, and beat me to it. So then Darwin, like, talked to his friends and, you know, what should I do? And they said, look, you present his stuff because that's, that's what you got to do because you're a gentleman. Then present your stuff, too. And so we went to this Linnean conference and he, uh, he's like, look, this is what Wallace has. And this is what I have. And no one cared, right? They were, they were on to something else, right? It wasn't a big deal. So that's it. It happened and no one cared. And he's like, all right, well, whatever. It's out now. I'm going to write a book on it. He wrote a book. He threw in all his evidence. He put his book out the next year, 1859. It was a massive hit, right? Everyone well, who was important in, in the upper crust, everyone was talking about it, right? So you go to a restaurant and you have dinner, every table, they're talking about this book, right? So it was really, um, you know, it was, it was really life-changing back then. So, um, so what are some of the things that he talked about? Well, common descent, right? He put pictures in his book of, like our, our arms, like our limbs, homologous, meaning that they're the same, right? So we have like, you know, your upper arm is a humerus, and then your forearm's got two bones in it, the radius, which is by your thumb, on the thumb side of your hand, and then the ulna, which is on the other side. And then you got like your wrist, which has like a lot of bones in it, actually. And then your fingers have, so anyway, the layout, the layout of your arm looks like the layout of a bat or a seal or human, well, humans, you know, so like different animals, whales, you know. So he was saying that we all come from a common ancestor and what we could all have in common, like what do we have in common with like bats were, were mammals or whales? Like what do we have in common with bats and whales? Like how can we come, all come from the same what so monkeys bats whales were like from the same place like well think about it we all we all have milk we all have hair check out our bones same they, they look a little bit longer or shorter and stuff but it's the same same bones same layout so this is you know these um these traits made us mammals and then he's like look and we can take all of us mammals and we can combine us with other things for example um you know everything everything that has a backbone that's a group and then, and then he said something else like look at the embryos if you take the embryos of fish and the embryos of humans early on they look really similar right they've got it looks like when you look at a human embryo, it looks like they have like gills up there, like really early on, right? So they've got these arches near their head. The way that the blood, pat, the blood vessels are starting to lay themselves out as an embryo are very similar, right? So there's, there's some, a lot of similarities in these embryos in things that are gonna be very different when, they, when they're born. <clears throat> so that was one of my, Darwin's ideas, and of course, the most famous is natural natural selection. So he's reading this. You know, there is this guy that came out a little bit before, named Thomas Malthus, and um, we still talk about Malthus today. And he said this. Um, he was like a he's like a Catholic priest or something, but anyway, he's like, well, look, the Earth's population right now is eight hundred million people, and this is like crazy. Right. And uh, so food production is like linear, right? It's, it's on a, it's on a, like a linear scale, but, but um, 
reproduction is exponential. So if you look at like those, you know, if you think about uh, like a reproduction curve, if you think about how uh, like a curve that's exponential, right? You have three kids and each of those three kids have three kids and it just, it gets crazy after a while, right? But food isn't being produced like that. That's what Malthus thinks. So at some point we're going to outstrip our, the amount of resources we have. We're going to be more of a population that we can feed. And that was when there was only eight, there wasn't even a billion people. And so Malthus, you know, he was a Catholic, but he was kind of influential because at that time he was like, hey, look, everyone, you know, I'm not saying birth control. I'm just saying maybe we could just sit down and like think about things before having the next kid. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, you know, maybe just think about it. And you know, it's his way of saying, hey, the earth is way overpopulated. And if you look at demography today, they're like in two groups. They're called the Malthusians and the anti-Malthusians. And the Malthusians say exactly this. Yeah, it is damn crowded here. We're like at 8 billion people and we need to have some thinning out. And um, then you have another group saying, hey, you know, Malthus said that there was going to be no food and... You know, you can get a, a, a banquet frozen dinner at Walmart for 88 cents. So the way I'm looking at it, food's like way cheaper than it ever was. I don't see anyone getting skinnier. Quite the opposite. So, and then the Malthusians are like, yeah, but you know what? Like, got this coronavirus and, you know, things happen. It might not just be about food. So anyway, they're always arguing. Darwin, and they were arguing about this back then. This was an old, this was an old argument. Darwin was saying, yeah, you know what? We don't produce, we don't reproduce as many as we can. Not everyone, you know, you have 10 kids, they don't all live. Back then they didn't, right? And especially animals. Animals have a bunch of offspring, they don't live. So he's like, you know, that, that means we're not reproducing to our full capacity. So some of these things are going to die. You know, when you have all of these um, ants, some of these ants are going to die. Some of these beetles or whatever it is, um, hippopotamus, they're all, they're going to die. Now, they're not all going to make it to become fully grown. So who lives and who dies? It depends on, there's a competition, right? And so that depends on what, the traits you have, if you have a better trait, if you're a rabbit that lives in the snow and all your brothers have darker fur than you, you might get to hang around for longer because you probably blend in a little bit more, you know? And so having like a really good trait depends on the environment you live in, right? Because if you're living in the rainforest, that white coat, that sucks, right? That's not a good trait now. So but the ones with the best trait are more likely to reproduce and not get eaten. Well, let me put it the other way, not get eaten and therefore likely to reproduce. And more of their kids are going to have white fur. And then as you just keep going down the generations, you're going to get mostly all rabbits with white fur. And, and Darwin was hanging around with some pigeon, pigeon, pigeon breeders. And they were making these like, you know, they're breeding them to, to have like really beautiful white plumes on them and stuff like that. And so Darwin, like, you know, at the same time, he's like, yeah, you know what? We're always playing around with like dogs and cats and pigeons and stuff like that. That's artificial selection. So this is probably what happens. Like, this is probably like a naturally occurring event. So natural selection. Well, we're going to look at, like, in the next chapter or two, is some things that he didn't know. And there was lots of things he didn't know. Um, but something that was, like, puzzling him was how these traits are passed down. Like, you can make a pigeon with, like, this beautiful plume, but some of the offspring, 
even like way down the line are not going to have this plume. He was talking about like dominant and recessive traits. So how, how is it that you, that that happens? Like he didn't understand. He didn't understand that about genes or chromosomes. Right. And, um, there was another guy, Mendel, who was actually, he had already figured this out, but Darwin never read. Darwin had his book. He just never got around reading it. So he never knew this. They didn't know the age of the earth. You know, some people are saying 70,000 years. Some people saying eight. Some people saying, you know, different numbers. But he didn't know. No one knew. And he had no idea that continents moved, continental drift. So these are some things that, you know, he didn't know. And we're going to look at that in uh subsequent chapters so that's it for this chapter and you know let me know if you have any questions